our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Very good afternoon to you and welcome to the show. I'm Vanessa Feltz. This is what's coming up. The threat of China. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden promises to hold the Chinese government accountable for its actions after accusing Beijing of multiple cyber attacks. Plus, social cohesion is failing. Towns and cities across Britain are struggling to deal with extremism, being whipped up by Islamists and the far right. And out in the cold. Harry and Meghan only found out about Princess Kate's cancer just like the rest of us through her TV announcement because Prince William didn't trust them not to leak the news. First of all, though, let's have the news headlines for Divya Coley. Good afternoon. The government says China is responsible for major cyber attacks targeting the Electoral Commission and MPs. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden says the government's doing what it can to address the threat. But Sir Ian Duncan Smith says the response is too slow and is calling for a new era in relations with China. So we should stand up, call them what they are, and then say, if you deal with us, you deal with us on the basis that we don't fully trust you. The question really is for us, it is really now time for us to recognise, particularly with what we may well be seeing uh, concerning the Electoral Commission stuff, that, that they are, have a malign influence and therefore they have become a threat. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister is facing yet another by-election as former Tory Scott Benton has resigned. It comes after an investigation by The Times into the Blackpool South MP. Mr Benton was suspended last April after being filmed allegedly offering to lobby ministers on behalf of gambling companies in exchange for money. Israel has cancelled its White House visit after the US changed its position by abstaining from a vote for a ceasefire in Gaza. The UN Security Council passed its resolution calling for an immediate end to the conflict. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says America's actions will hurt efforts to release more than 130 hostages. Four men have been charged with terrorism in Russia following a concert hall attack that killed 137 people. The men appeared in court in Moscow earlier. Islamic State says it was behind the attack today. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, said the same group attempted several attacks in France. The country's terror alert has been raised to its highest level. Two men have been found guilty of murdering a semi-professional footballer on a nightclub dance floor. Cody Fisher was stabbed to death by Remy Gordon and Cammie Carpenter at Birmingham's Crane nightclub on Boxing Day in 2022. The court heard it was an act of revenge following a minor altercation days earlier. A rare total solar eclipse will sweep across the US, Mexico and Canada in what's described as our planet's greatest spectacle. It occurs when the moon passes between Earth and the sun. This year it will be seen on the 8th of April, although the UK will be lucky to get a glimpse of a partial eclipse, depending on where you live. That's the latest weather time now with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's looking pretty wet out there for this afternoon, particularly across northern areas of the UK. We started off with the rain out towards the west this morning and it's been steadily moving its way northwards across parts of the UK. Now, there's some heavy downpour still to be had, particularly later across parts of the west of England and Wales. And as that rain hits the colder air sitting across northern parts of Scotland, particularly into tonight, there will be some significant snowfall over the high ground of central and eastern Scotland. For parts of eastern England, though, I think it will 
will just about stay dry this afternoon with some bright or sunny spells and with the uh, light southerly winds it will feel pretty mild but feeling cool elsewhere although temperatures around average for the time of year. Now overnight as I said that rain steadily moves its way further northwards across the higher elevations of central and eastern Scotland there could be as much as 20 centimetres of snow this could cause some tricky driving conditions for tomorrow morning. Elsewhere we're seeing rain across the uh, north of England over Ireland and Northern Ireland and some showery rain starting to push up tomorrow morning across central and southern parts of England as well as for Wales. But for northern and eastern England I think we will see some sunny spells tomorrow afternoon and it should become drier and brighter for Scotland too. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Divya Rant and Nazanin. Let's move now directly to our top story. Breaking news in the last hour. The government say China is linked to a cyber attack which managed to access the personal data of millions of British voters. The attack on the Electoral Commission took place back in August 2021, but was only revealed by the government last year. The Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, has laid out how the UK will respond. Our political processes and institutions have not been harmed by these attacks. The government will continue to call out and condemn this kind of activity in the strongest terms. We will continue to work with our allies to ensure that Chinese state-affiliated actors suffer the consequences of their behaviour. And we will take preventative action to ensure these attempts do not succeed. The cyber threat posed by China-affiliated actors is real and it is serious, but it is more than equaled by our determination and resolve to resist it. Joining me in the studio now is Talk TV political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald. Hi, Alicia. And down the line is the assistant editor at The Spectator, Cindy Yu. Good to have you both on board. Let me, let me start with you, Alicia, just to set the scene here. Um, we hear from Oliver Dowden there, you know, there's no harm done. Nothing has really been achieved by the Chinese doing what they tried to do. And, and most... Uh, I don't know what to say about this. I, 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 I think he hopes that it's bracing uh, and kind of firm and inspiring. You know, we will call them out on this. You know, we will make no bones about the fact that they really are not to do this. Naughty, 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 naughty China. Don't do it because we're very, very cross. Are we going to punish you in any way? No. Is there anything we can do to stop you doing it again? No. Are we even going to threaten you with anything? No, we're not. We're just going to say don't do that again. It all seems to me feeble and it feels as if we're not necessarily getting the full picture here. Well, the issue is, is this threat of China is something that's been murmuring for quite some time yes. now. The Foreign Affairs Committee in Parliament discuss it semi-regularly and every time when it comes to the big question, do we label China as a malicious state? Do we label it as a threat? It usually boils down to no. Why? Because we actually rely on China so much and China have become such a powerful player in the world And stage. when you say we rely on China so much, you mean to, as a as a manufacturer of yes. cheap goods? What what else do we rely on China Just, for? I mean, it's particularly that, technology. Mm. I mean, iPhones, all mm. of these things, like all of the parts, everything, lots, pretty much most things seem to come from right. China. But we're their customer, though. They're not our customer. True, but what's the alternative? That's the thing. So it's like, you know, you can, you can say, well, China's a threat and we can worsen our relationship with China, but then what? What is the alternative? And at the moment, there doesn't seem to be one. The other issue politically is that if you start labelling China as a threat or a malicious state, does that then worsen our already deteriorating relationship with with the Chinese officials? Right. And the answer is probably yes. Let me bring Cindy Yu into this. Cindy, thank you so much for joining us. Tell me how worrying, how sinister, how, how much foreboding we should feel at the news of China doing what it's done and what it did in 2021. And the idea that, well, nothing much to see here, nothing really happened, everyone's fine, nobody's details were used or abused, so forget, move on and wag a finger at China and tell them not to do it again would almost seem as if this is something that was rather slight and is now done and dusted, but I don't think it really mm. feels that way, does it? 
No, I don't think it does feel that way. Um, and there are two attacks that we're talking about here. There's one that's on the Electoral Commission, which has compromised the data of 40 million voters. And there's another one which Dowden said was absolutely unsuccessful, which basically tried to hack into the email accounts of a number of parliamentarians, three or four of them. Now, I'm less worried about the second one because as politicians, unfortunately, that is what they have to deal with from different countries all over the world. And they have the higher security capacity to deal with that. And that's why that attempt was unsuccessful. I'm quite worried about the Electoral Commission one, though, because uh, you, you suggested earlier, Vanessa, that we're not getting the full picture. And to some extent, we never would with this kind of intelligence question. Yeah. Um, but it didn't feel to me like from Dowden's statement that he was speaking to the people involved. You know, I probably have my details on the open register. You probably have yours as well, because people generally don't tick the anonymous um, box. But what does that mean for those people? And especially um, I'm concerned from the views of the uh, critics of the Chinese Communist Party in this country, especially the Hong Kong refugees that we've taken in in the last um, few years, over 125,000 of them. I would have liked Dowden to say a little bit more about that. Um, and to be fair to him, he did talk about the ways in which MI5 would help businesses and individuals counter the Chinese um, cyber threat. But anecdotally, from people that I've spoken to who've tried to make use of that MI5 service, they found it's a bit of a, you know, a ring tone, ringing, um, <laughs> dialing tone kind of situation wow. where they're not actually getting through to immediate help very quickly. T tell me, Cindy, what is it that people whose data has been accessed should fear? Is it kind of mind games that the Chinese insidiously, subtly and undetectably will try to influence, for example, the way people vote? And if they do, how on earth they do that? I've got absolutely no idea, but that's one of the implications. Or is it something else? What is, what is the worry? What are we concerned about here, would you say? Look, Vanessa, it's important to caveat, first of all, that I'm not a cybersecurity expert on this one. But from what we do know of the story is that um, this kind of data is personal with de details such as who's registered to vote, what their addresses are, perhaps who else is in their household. So it's less about influencing how they would vote, because knowing that data doesn't necessarily help you with that, but more about maybe personal data of where individuals live and are. Um, as I say, if I were a refugee from Hong Kong who was involved in the Hong Kong protests and have now come to seek a refuge in the UK, I would be quite concerned about the Chinese state having that data. At the same time, I have to say, <laughs> you know, we live in a very complicated grey world. Security services know all sorts of stuff that we as ordinary citizens don't know that they do know. And then it takes a leak like uh, the Edward Snowden leaks or WikiLeaks for us to find out just the extent to which all of this data is out there. So again, as I say, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, so it could be that all of this data is out there already. And when Dowden was questioned, what does China want from all of this? He actually couldn't really answer. So it's not clear, I think, what they were really hoping to get, because it's certainly not financial gain, but also, as I say, it wouldn't influence anyone's voting habits. So what is it? And I, I think that's a big hanging question, basically. Yes, and, and Alicia, the implication is, and I don't know whether you consider it to be true or not, but the implication is that the Chinese really excel at this, that they are the world's superpower when it comes to this kind of infiltration of, of other information, spying and espionage and all that kind of stuff, and that we just, by definition, are much less good at it, more plodding, more leaden, less subtle, so we don't reciprocate in kind, or if we do, we don't do it as well as they do. Is that, is that the kind of received wisdom on this? Yes, sadly it is, and I think Cindy made a really good point there about the fact that maybe this information is already things that China have access to. Well, remember that TikTok, which is a Chinese-owned uh, social media platform, was banned in Parliament last year, and the USA are even talking about banning it in the, the whole of the United States of America, which would be a really significant move. And the reason for that is compromise of data mm -hmm. and the data that people are putting in there, people think that that, that might be potentially being used by China for some kind of gain. I, again, though, that is the issue. We don't really know what it's being weaponized for, but what we do know is that it, it's clearly being done on purpose for some reason. So that's that's the worrying side. All right, Cindy, what do you think of, of, of Oliver, uh, Oliver Dadden sort of slightly showing his teeth? But when I say slightly, I mean, you know, desperately unconvincingly, a bit like a parent saying, you know, if you don't go to bed immediately, young lady, I'm going to have to take away your pocket money. You know, they don't really mean it. It really did feel on that level. You know, we've made absolutely no bones about telling the Chinese, up with this, we will not put. It's like, well, what do you mean? Why would they care less about that? I mean, what, what do you think of that in terms of international power play? Don't do it again. We don't like it. Stop it. 
Look, Oliver Dowden is not necessarily the fiercest of politicians that you could roll out <laughs> on the Conservative benches or, the, or even the government benches, for example. Um, Security Minister Tom Tugendhat, for example, has been known to be much more vocal about his criticism of China in the past. But, you know, Vanessa, I have to say, yes, there is a benefit in telling China off, in, in, in hold, upholding our interests um, and basically saying this is not on. But there's also a limit to that in the sense that how effective will that be and how much is it talking a bigger game than you're actually doing? So, so for me, it's not so much about the rhetoric that we're seeing as private citizens uh, out in the public sphere, but also but more about the, the, the stuff that has teeth behind the scenes. Who are these people that they've sanctioned? How strict are the sanctions? What is the resilience building mechanisms for the Electoral Commission and for individual MPs and for individual citizens that they've talked about? Um, are we really tackling the Chinese threat in reality? I don't care so much about the rhetoric because, frankly, a lot of the politicians can just talk over each other like that. And China's very good at a fierce rhetoric as well. But really, what's happening behind the scenes um, in terms of making us more resilient against this Chinese challenge? That, that's the bigger question, I think. And it's quite hard to think about or quantify when we're not really quite sure of the level of threat, isn't it? We're not absolutely certain what it is we think they're trying to do, whether we think they've succeeded in doing it. When you can't identify the, the threat itself, then this makes it a very notional kind of conversation, not going very far, Cindy, doesn't it? I think part of the things that we could do is cutting reliance. And then that's something that the government has been doing a bit better in the last few years. So Oliver Dowden mentioned the, the, the removal of Chinese investment in Sizewell C, that nuclear plant, for example. Um, there are other live issues such as Chinese investment in, in the UK's battery making capacity for EVs in the future, which will become such an important um, supply chain, such an important industry in the future. So we're building, we, are we protecting ourselves from future reliance as well. So that's one thing, you know, to Alicia's point about how much we rely on China, we can try to basically reduce that reliance. I think we can also basically give people a bit more education, especially when it comes to universities and private businesses who have a lot of dealing with Chinese actors. Do they know what is beyond the red line? Do they know what kind of information they should share and what kind of information that could be used for malicious intent? That's a kind of educational side of things that we could also do. But yes, Vanessa, you're right. We're not calling them a threat. And I think part of that is because the UK wants to be in line with the US on this. And the US has been warming up its relations with China over the last few months, TikTok aside um in general so so we i think there is a collective action question here as well where the uk doesn't want to be stepping out of line by itself cindy thank you very much indeed thanks a lot let's move on to scott benton so the story is this tory mp scott benton is quitting parliament almost a year after being embroiled in a lobbying sting he's the mp for blackpool south but not for long and he says he's written to jeremy hunt with a heavy heart saying he wants to quit we all know what that means alicia so should we just take this back and just remind people what yes. happened with Scott Benton? Let's. He was embroiled in a lobbying scandal, just like <laughs> seemingly lots of MPs over the years. And this was him saying that he would, in exchange for money, lobby ministers, lobby government ministers um, on behalf of a gambling um, firm. And he was actually caught by undercover journalists. This then triggered him to be suspended from the House of Commons. And at the moment, obviously before he resigned just now today, um, we were waiting for what we call a recall petition, which is where a petition is sent to his constituents in Blackpool South, and they decide whether or not they want to have a by-election to replace him as their MP. So we were still waiting on that, but he kind of nips that in the bud um, before we got the result and decided to resign himself, meaning that there will definitely be another by-election for Rishi Sunak. Oh. I mean, do you remember when these were rare things that never yes. happened? We have one about every month at the moment and pretty much all of them seem to be being lost from Conservative seats to, to something else. So definitely not good news for Rishi. Again. And is there anything considered disloyal or bad form about throwing the towel in just before a general election? Is it, is it, is it kind of considered a more noble uh, way of, of fulfilling your calling as a politician to wait and, you know, try? And if you lose, you lose? Or is this, people do, is it a bit like, I, I hesitate to say it, but rats deserting a sinking ship, is that what's happening? <laughs> I think generally it is seen, given how close we are to a general election, it obviously will be in the next few months and whenever that point is, it has to be before January 2025. So there's going to be one very soon. I think generally lots of people would take the starts that you should just wait. It costs a lot of money to hold a by-election, mm. a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of effort. 
But in this particular case, it was likely that Scott Benton would have lost this recall petition vote. So there probably would have been a by-election anyway without him resigning. So you could just say he's maybe just sped up that process, which, which I'm sure isn't really a bad thing for lots of his constituents who potentially would like to see him replace. The interesting thing here as well, so this was a Conservative seat held by Scott Benton, but before he won that in the last election, it wasn't a Conservative seat since 1992. Mm. So this is definitely predicted to go back to Labour. Gosh, all right, Lucy, thank you very much indeed. Let's move on now. The United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution that demands a ceasefire in Gaza for the rest of Ramadan. The Muslim Holy Month began on the 10th of March and is set to finish on the 9th of April, meaning the council's calling for a two-week ceasefire. The US abstained from the vote, with the 14 other council members, including Russia, China and the UK, voting in favour of the resolution. So let's bring in journalist Noga Tarnopolsky, who's in Jerusalem for us, this afternoon. Noga, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, I wonder whether there's any surprise in Israel at what I've just revealed and whether it might have any effect at all on Netanyahu. Well, um, I don't know about surprise. I think that the Israeli government had a sense that this was coming. Um, and the statement issued by Netanyahu appears to have been written ahead of time because he misquotes some of the text of the resolution. That said, the Israeli prime minister, um, the personal interests of the Israeli prime minister right now are in direct conflict with the interests of his state. And so what we are seeing is a prime minister trying to maneuver so as to uh, retain the support of his ever smaller ultra right wing base. And he's doing that by provoking Joe Biden and trying to claim to the Israeli public, only I can stand up to Joe Biden, while Joe Biden is one of the most, sorry, one of the most popular figures in Israel today because of the massive and immediate support he afforded Israel when Israel was attacked in October. And so that's what we're seeing, something cracking in the Israeli polity. And when something cracks, inevitably the crack becomes bigger and turns into a fissure and turns into a chasm, and then what? So, so I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, Noga. I've known you too well to, to, to ask you to foresee the future, but what do you think might happen in the immediate future as a result of this, if it's about to be a schism of some kind? I don't know about a schism. I think the White House is very much aware of Netanyahu's domestic situation and is really trying to kind of walk between the raindrops. So if you see the White House emphasized in a statement just in the last hour that it has not changed its policy, that it only um, that it couldn't support this resolution because it doesn't uh, I can't remember call for uh, it doesn't condemn Hamas, but mm -hmm. it did just abstain because it does call for the immediate release of hostages. So the White House is kind of trying to hold to a rational and defensible line. And I think hoping that Netanyahu doesn't, you know, go all Greek wedding and start throwing glasses at the White House. But as Israelis know well, Israelis, about 19% of Israelis currently support the prime minister. So Israelis are now seeing on a global stage what they have seen from Netanyahu in recent weeks, which is an increasingly stressed and um, possibly risky politician in charge. And, and how deep the wound of the missing hostages still is, is that reflected in calls for and campaigns for and protests demanding that the Israeli government do something, anything, whatever it takes to facilitate the return of those of those hostages who are still, let's pray, alive and can be returned. The, the protests are daily and are increasingly desperate. And the Israeli government is not only ignoring these incre really heart-rending demands, mm. but is um, has had a certain degree of success in turning the families of these hostages who Let's restate, these are Israeli civilians who were stolen from their beds, from their homes at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning mm. when the Hamas, the terror organization, invaded Israel and Israel was unable to protect its own borders. 
So these people were betrayed many times over, and the government is now attempting to turn their family members into kind of, you know, leftists who oppose the right-wing government. I do have to tell you in this regard that Mrs. Sarah Netanyahu, the prime minister's wife, this week was caught complaining. In, you know, she was recorded complaining that when um, Israel did succeed in securing a hostage for prisoner exchange in November, and some terrorists, uh, some, excuse me, hostages were released, quote, they didn't even bother to thank us. Um, oh and so goodness. that gives you a sense of, yes, that gives you a sense of how this government feels. My goodness, that sounds absolutely uh, deplorable in terms crass. of any kind of, that really crass, really does. I know when we first started speaking to one another on the television, Noga, uh, after October the 7th, very early, very soon after, when the hostages were taken, when there was this terrible massacre, the biggest massacre since the Holocaust of Jews, we wondered then how is Netanyahu going to end this? What, what conclusion is he aiming for? Could there ever be, even in his dreams, a day when Hamas was totally eradicated physically, ideologically, in every way? Would he know when that day came, if it ever came, could it ever come? How would this finish? How would it end? And I don't know whether you feel on the inside there that you're any closer to knowing that or working out what the strategy is, if there is a strategy. I think that six months into this tragedy, we know that there is no strategy. And we know that for many intents and purposes, the war is over. Israel has withdrawn almost all its soldiers from the Gaza Strip. What we're seeing now are kind of surgical operations aimed at specific targets, like the Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, like certain sites in Khan Yunis, in southern Gaza, that this is no longer a war as we conceive of a war, despite the fact that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has not declared formally the end of the war. And again, I'm sorry to say this, but I feel like it's my duty to say it. There are massive demands in Israel for elections the minute the war is open, for new elections. About 80% of Israelis are demanding elections, which um, look very bad for Netanyahu. And it's hard not to think that one of the reasons he's refusing to declare an end to this war is because he doesn't want to face the pressure of that mass of Israelis calling for a change of government. He also doesn't want to face the pressure of massive calls for a national commission of inquiry into how this debacle occurred. So it does appear as if he's simply trying to kick the can down the road for all of these things um, that provide, you know, that are difficult for him. And let's remind the audience as well that Netanyahu is on trial for serious charges of corruption and that in his six months in power before uh, the Hamas attack, he attempted to, he attempted a sort of judicial coup. He attempted to pass a raft of laws which would have given him basically unfettered power over the judiciary. Mm. So he really is a trapped lion and that's how he's behaving. Noga, thank you very much indeed. Very best wishes to you. Coming up after the break, is social cohesion failing? The new report warns harassment is posing a serious threat to our way of life. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, 
that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite right, um, too. Quite right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Over 75% of the British public now feel they have to refrain from speaking their minds because of the chilling levels of harassment from Islamists and the far right. That is according to a new report from the government's independent social cohesion advisor, who's warned there is a serious threat to our democratic way of life. As part of her review, Dame Sara is recommending an exclusion zone for protests outside schools, following the case of the teacher who was forced into hiding after showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad. She said the teacher was totally and utterly failed. Joining me on the programme now, Dr. Azama Hassan, Imam and Islamic scholar. Good to have you on the programme. That seems like a very daunting figure, doesn't it? 75% of people think they can't speak their minds. They're worried and nervous to do so. Do you, do you understand that fear and the root of it? Yes, of course, it's, it's very worrying. And uh, I think it's not just far-right and Islamist groups. There are far-left groups, uh, if you like. Unfortunately, the debate in this country around Brexit has been very polarised, uh, where it didn't need to be, and political discourse in general has become quite toxic, actually. Uh, this, this seems to be a breakdown in kind of just civilised discourse and behaviour, uh, and that's at the root of some of this. Uh, with my own work within the Muslim community and actually counter-extremism work uh, against the far right and Islamist also, uh, one does get a lot of threats and abuse and intimidation. I've certainly faced that over the last 12 or 13 years, so I can relate to the findings. But I was shocked uh, at the high level. In this report, they polled over a 1,000 uh, random people across Britain and found very high levels of people self-censoring and being afraid to speak out. And, of course, that is a concern for our democratic way of life. What, if anything, do you think can be done about it, Doctor? Well, Dame Sarah has come up with a number of uh, recommendations, uh, which are really quite sensible, uh, you know, uh, asking government and all other agencies to promote fundamental British values, to promote the idea of a common, uh, fruitful, positive vision of our country. It's a kind of active citizenship idea. It's not just, you know, let life uh, continue. But then there are specific proposals like outlawing protests within 150 meters of schools, which I think is a very sensible idea because children should not be dragged into this, you know, with the exception of teachers picketing on strike, for example. But uh, wh where there are concerns, parents and parents should take that up with teachers, of course, and with other authorities. But uh, 
this Batley school in particular had to go offline. There's a school very near me actually, where I live in East London, which also nearly had to go offline because of intimidatory protests outside the school. And, and that's no good. Primary and secondary school children should not have to face that kind of harassment. And uh, by cracking down on this kind of thing, I think the authorities can send a clear signal that we want a more civilized and harmonious and tolerant society where people can have vigorous debate and they have strongly held views, but there is a space for that in a democracy to argue, argue your case without resorting to harassment. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining me. We'll certainly watch this space. Coming up after the break, despite the Princess of Wales' brave decision to share her cancer diagnosis with the world, conspiracies are still being shared about her online. I'm Vanessa Feltz. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. It's been three days now since the Princess of Wales made her shock revelation to the country about her cancer diagnosis. But disinformation about Kate is still running rampant online. Whitehall sources now believe that China, Russia and Iran might be fueling the rumours about her on social media in an attempt to destabilise British institutions. While Kate's message has mainly been met with an outpouring of public support, unfounded conspiracies 
about the truthfulness of the diagnosis and the efficacy of chemotherapy are continuing to circulate online. Joining me in the studio, Talk TV's Royal Editor, Sarah Houston. Hi, Sarah. I mean, when we broke the news on, on Friday at six o'clock, you and I were, we were both absolutely devastated, as were so many people watching us uh, on television and listening on the radio, as was, we thought, the whole world. So I think we all dared to hope that this ridiculous kind of flurry of really malicious and unpleasant speculation online and trolling would stop, but it hasn't stopped. No, I guess haters are going to hate, aren't they? Mm. And, and what this episode has done is draw to everyone's attention just how prevalent conspiracy theorists are online. And there's a reason, because they're making a lot of money mm. from this. You peddle a conspiracy theory that gets picked up uh, in America and then gets millions of views and you are paid on that basis. But also, it's not just individuals doing this. It is states, and it is suspected that China, Russia, and Iran are also behind this, because these conspiracy theories about the Princess of Wales had the ability to destabilize the institution of the monarchy and the perception of the monarchy in the public eyes. Mm. What has happened, though, I think, since Friday's statement, is that any members of the public who might have been slightly drawn in to some of those rumours and speculation now understand exactly what was happening and that these were just scurrilous rumours and speculation. And I think ordinary people know exactly now what happens and feel nothing but sympathy for the Princess Absolutely. of Wales. Absolutely, although there does seem to be a big difference between some horrible troll sitting at their device in, you know, some faraway hamlet churning out malice and bile and spite, and Russia, China or Iran orchestrating a campaign. Well, these troll factories it's that exist. It's hideous, isn't it? And the, the problem is with social media is the anonymity of it. Linda Yaccarino, the CEO of X Twitter, posted her expression of, of sympathy for the Princess of Wales, but actually it's in her power to do something about this. You know, you, you don't know now. Now that they've taken away the blue tick for anyone who's actually verified and you can pay for it, yes. anyone can have that right. It's very difficult to know who is real and who is not, what is a bot and what is not, particularly for the likes of you and me. Um, and so I, I think there certainly are questions. And Kensington Palace hoping that the social media companies might now look a little closer at this and what could be done to try and stop it in the future. While you and I have been talking uh, live on air, Sarah, we've heard that Sarah, Duchess of York, has, has just said that she has absolutely wholehearted admiration for the bravery and courage of the Princess of Wales. And, um, you know, she knows only too well how difficult this is. Yes. And Sarah uh, Ferguson has herself spoken very openly about her cancer battle double cancer battle for her, firstly with breast cancer and more latterly uh, with skin cancer. And it's quite remarkable, isn't it, when you think that within the space of a year we have had three members mm. of the royal family receiving diagnoses. I say it's remarkable, but of course it's not, is it? Because one in two of us will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in our lives. And what this shows is it just does not discriminate. It no. doesn't matter who you are. No. And, and, and actually, you know, even if you've had the very finest education and the finest food and you've had access to all manner of sports and games and exercise and a great deal of money, it still doesn't seem to make any difference at all. It's one of these terribly great levellers, isn't it, in the worst possible way. Let's talk about Easter because we were hoping, weren't we, that we might see Catherine and William at church. We don't think that's going to happen now. It's not going to happen. Actually, Kensington Palace have made that very clear. Um, the Waleses have headed off. They've gone to spend the Easter holidays at their home in Norfolk, a real retreat in the countryside where they can escape from it all and spend some proper quality time at the five of them together, which I think is really important for them at the moment. So they won't be attending at the Easter Sunday church service at Windsor. But we're starting to get the suggestion that perhaps if he's well enough and if his doctors decide it's okay, the king could potentially make an appearance with a, a sort of reduced 
congregation there. Again, they want to protect him, but we might see him uh, there at Easter. But it will look very different to last year, just ahead of the coronation. We had the whole family out in force in the spring sunshine. This is not going to look like that this year. No, and, and we're hearing a lot about the other members of the family. Now, further extended members of the family really stepping up. For example, the Duchess of Gloucester, of whom not much has been heard for many, many years. I remember when, when um, Prince Richard got married to her and she was, she was Brigitte van Der's, uh, a, a beautiful Scandinavian young lady. But they've led a very quiet life, haven't they? They haven't made much impact on the public, really. She's someone who's never given an interview, yeah. never sought the limelight, but has supported all of her charities uh, throughout. And she is continuing to... To do that. Uh, nothing really changes uh, for her except the spotlight yeah. really is a little bit more on her. She's still doing what she's been doing. It's just there's a little bit more attention on it now because yes. other members of the royal family are not being able to do their jobs. And when the news broke on Friday at six o'clock, one of the questions people started asking pretty quickly was, gosh, where does this leave Harry and Meghan? What will the Sussexes do? Will they respond? Won't they respond? And all sorts of news has emerged about how they found out for a start. Yes, it, it is thought that they were unaware of the Princess of Wales's diagnosis until that news was broadcast to the world at six o'clock on Friday evening. I think that just shows us how difficult relations are and how deep those wounds are that they weren't taken into the confidence of this. Uh, they did issue a statement wishing uh, Kate health and healing. We also understand that they reached out privately to the Prince and Princess Wells. Now, we don't know the nature of that conversation. We don't know uh, what is happening. But I think it's a stretch to suggest that this would be the moment and a catalyst for reconciliation between them, because that's really not a priority now for William and Kate. They, they want to focus everything on the children and Kate's own recovery. Do you think it's true that the Sussexes found out alongside the rest of the world because Prince William doesn't trust his brother and thought if he told him in advance it might be leaked? I think that's highly likely. We know that, that there's very limited communication uh, between them and, and I think there is an issue of trust. That, and this was such a tightly guarded secret for very good reason that they wanted their children to find out from them and not from the media and not from other people gossiping about it. And so I think they kept it to a very, very, very small group of people who knew. And it appears that Harry and Meghan were not part of that group and only found out when, when the rest of the world did. That issue of trust, you might think, absolutely central to any relationship. And very probably one of the biggest obstacles towards them ever having any sort of rapprochement, because if you really feel you can't trust your brother, then how can you have a relationship? And given what is going on with his wife, Prince William is more protective than ever. He's always been uh, protective over her, but not least of all, after uh, the claims made in Spare and Netflix, and they were pretty cruel, mm. actually, uh, about uh, Catherine and, you know, the suggestion that other male members of his family had married because someone fitted the mould rather than marrying for love. Uh, there was Omid Scobie's book, for example, that described uh, Catherine, the Princess of Wales, as a Stepford wife figure. Very, very cruel, very unfair, mm. and I think... Um, you know, they, William feels very protective and particularly right now will want to shield his wife from any kind of extra stress or trauma. And speculation today that Meghan's, what the heck is it called again, Orchard what? American Riviera Orchard. American Riviera Orchard, forgive me for not remembering that, brand which we know is going to be flogging bird bars and jams and uh, stationery and all kinds of things. Copper pans. Yeah, copper pans and all pretty expensive too, has actually taken its inspiration from another brand altogether that she quite wanted to, to, to sign up with and go and work with, but they weren't keeping to have her. Yes, this is a brand called Flamingo Estate, which is based in California. It's like an uber posh farm shop. Think Dalesford or right. something like that. If you want, let me have a look at some of the items they sell. A uh, £200 jar of honey, wow. uh, for example, from Julianne Moore's Bees, no Gosh. less. Uh, a range of candles endorsed by the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and um, some washing up liquid, Heritage Tomato scented washing up liquid, all with a very hefty price tag. Uh, apparently, Megan is a big admirer and she had tried to invest. She wanted to be involved in the brand. Uh, they didn't take her on board and so she set up her own, which, uh, according to those in the know, looks suspiciously like the brand <laughs> that she aspires to.
Gosh, and, and when will we know whether her brand is a success or not? Well, we've only had, as yet, the very slick video uh, of Megan in their Montecito home wearing a black ball gown and mm. seeing her cooking, for example, in the pans. Uh, we've only had that sneak peek uh, so far. It's going to launch April time, we understand, mid uh, to late April. Uh, and after that, and, and there'll be a huge amount of attention on this. Mm. And actually, it's not something new for her. It's something that she did a lot of stuff around when she had her blog, The Tig, the lifestyle blog, talking about food, talking about homewares. I, I think she wants to create this. And we know she's been working on her new brand, this kind of Martha Stewart-esque brand, yes. isn't it? Slash Gwyneth Paltrow, I don't know. Um, so it will be interesting to see just how that is received by Americans. Can we buy it over here? I don't know. Well, we'll yeah, wait and I guess, see, won't we? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> perhaps they'll start in the US. So shipping might be quite expensive for a copper pan, might <laughs> it? Sarah, thank you very much indeed. Coming up after the break, should there be a ban on children in nappies starting school? I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Whirl -missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. For... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. There's a growing backlash against the increasing number of parents who are sending their children to primary school in nappies. According to a new survey, nine in ten parents believe that children should not be allowed to start school until they're toilet trained. 
But while experts say that most children are capable of learning how to use the lavatory by the age of three, 25% of them are arriving at reception class without the basic skill to do so. Joining me now, former primary school head teacher and parenting expert Sue Atkins. Sue, lovely to see you. Good to have you on board. When you were a primary school head teacher, was there an issue with little ones starting school uh, still in nappies? No, there wasn't. I mean, of course, kids start school, usually able to go to the toilet, hold a pen, sit and listen for a little while. So I don't quite know what's happened in the last, say, 20 years, because I looked it up. And in 1957, 90% of children at the age of two were potty trained. Mm. So we seem to have gone really bad. And what's distressing in this report is that 50% of parents think it's the job of the teacher. And of course, 92% of the teachers don't think it's their responsibility. And they're actually setting up new kind of departments to look after children who are coming to school that are not school ready. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that when I sent my little ones to nursery school, they had to be potty trained or they weren't allowed to start. That was a tremendous, they were two and a half. It was a tremendous yeah. incentive. And I remember, I'm thinking, I was thinking about it this morning and I was thinking, were any parents at all not permitted to send their children because they'd somehow not succeeded in toilet training them? And the answer was no, everybody knew they had to, so they succeeded. No one's saying it's easy, it's not easy. And no one's saying it's pleasant because it's not pleasant and it can take ages and it can be really exhausting. But everybody seemed to manage to crack it by the time they were two and a half and went to nursery school. And I'm talking about, I know, about 35 years ago, but babies are still babies, surely. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. And I'm kind of horrified, really. So I don't really know what the reason is. And I was trying to ponder it. Um, you know, you can always say working parents. And of course, parents were staying home more and they had more time for the children. But I don't think it's that. I mean, I even thought about, is it the nappies? Because they are so sophisticated now that yeah. children are not uncomfortable so that they can wear them, you know, longer and longer. But, you know, this is taking up so much of the teacher's time. And I used to teach 35, four year olds. Mm. So I know firsthand how to, to go about it. And of course, kids have accidents, but they're not coming in at actually in nappies and you're having to take t apparently according to this research two and a half hours every day mm. is hijacked not teaching children actually doing those sort of basic skills with them it really does seem as if the parents who say listen we don't think that these children in nappies should be in our children's class because they're taking up all the time and it's not a, a a profitable thing for the teacher to be doing that have have a few like you know really quite sizable legs to stand on here don't they you might say that schools will just have to make it known it's not it's not acceptable it can't be done unless the child has special needs or a medical condition the of child course. must be toilet trained and that's it well, also, according to, I did the research of having a look at this survey because I thought it was really interesting, obviously, because I'm interested in this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and 43% of parents say they didn't really know about what school readiness was. And then 69% of school staff think parents should receive more guidance. So something's going wrong where we're stepping backwards rather than stepping forwards and getting kids what you would normally call ready. Now, I know the pandemic came, but in fact, that was an opportunity to spend more time with children, talking with them, playing with them, reading to them, getting them ready for school so that they hit the ground running. Because there's so many pieces of research that show that children who are not ready at school are behind sort of all I'm the way have through to stop you mid, the, mid the conversation but thank you Sue very much it was a delight to have you coming up after the break the government's being urged to review homicide laws after being told murderers are currently able to get away with murder I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with talk on TV radio online and on your smart speaker Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong.
Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon to you. A very warm welcome back to the show. Great to have your company. I'm Vanessa Feltz, and this is what's coming up this hour. Murderers can get away with murder. The words of Barnaby Webber's mother after a review confirmed prosecutors were right to accept the Nottingham triple killer's manslaughter pleas on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Plus, the gender pay gap in Hollywood. Oscar-winning actress Olivia Colman says she'd be paid way more if she was called Oliver, not Olivia. And the new dynamic duo, Anne and Sophie, pair up to share the royal burden as the slimmed-down monarchy prepares for Easter Sunday. First of all, though, let's have the news headline with Divya Coley. Good afternoon. The government says China is responsible for major cyber attacks targeting the Electoral Commission and MPs. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden says the government's doing what it can to address the threat, but some MPs who've been targeted said the response is too slow. Talk TV political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald told Vanessa this threat of China has been murmuring for quite some time now. The Foreign Affairs Committee in Parliament discuss it semi-regularly and every time when it comes to the big question, do we label China as a malicious state? Do we label it as a threat? It usually boils down to no. Why? Because we actually rely on China so much and China have become such a powerful player in the world. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister is facing yet another by-election as former Tory Scott Benton has resigned. It comes after an investigation by The Times into the Blackpool South MP. Mr Benton was suspended last April after being filmed allegedly offering to lobby ministers on behalf of gambling companies in exchange for money. Israel has cancelled its White House visit after the U.S. changed its position by abstaining from a vote for a ceasefire in Gaza. The U.N. Security Council passed its resolution calling for an immediate end to the conflict. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says America's actions will hurt efforts to release more than 130 hostages. But speaking from Jerusalem, journalist Noga Tarnopolsky told Vanessa people are losing their trust in Netanyahu. About 19% of Israelis currently support the prime minister. So Israelis are now seeing on a global stage what they have seen from Netanyahu in recent weeks, which is an increasingly stressed 
and um, possibly risky politician in charge. Donald Trump will become the first former or current U.S. president in history to face criminal trial. The proceedings will begin in three weeks in connection to so-called hush money paid to a porn star before the 2016 election. Mr. Trump strongly denies all charges against him. Two men have been found guilty of murdering a semi-professional footballer on a nightclub dance floor. Cody Fisher was stabbed to death by Remy Gordon and Cammy Carpenter at Birmingham's Crane nightclub on Boxing Day in 2022. The court heard it was an act of revenge following a minor altercation days earlier. And a rare total solar eclipse will sweep across the US, Mexico and Canada in what's described as our planet's greatest spectacle. It occurs when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun. This year it will be seen on the 8th of April, although the UK will be lucky to get a glimpse of a partial eclipse depending on where you live. That's the latest weather time now with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's been rather wet across many parts of the UK for today. We saw rain start off across western parts of the UK this morning with some heavy downpours. And throughout today, it has been steadily moving its way northwards across many areas. Although eastern parts of England haven't been too bad, mostly fine and bright there and the north of Scotland. But as we head into tonight, we'll see that rain continue its journey further northwards. And as it hits cold air across central and eastern parts of Scotland, there's the risk of significant snow across the high ground there, anything above 300 metres there could be as much as 20 centimetres. Elsewhere, we're looking at spells of rain for Northern Ireland, parts of Northern England, and there will be some rain as well spreading up towards central and southern parts of England tomorrow morning and Wales, most of it light and patchy. But for Northern and Eastern parts of England throughout tomorrow, there will be bright or sunny spells and Scotland will become drier and brighter, but it will be a cold day across parts of Scotland. Temperatures struggling to get above mid-single figures. Beyond that, and we continue with the uh, conveyor belt of weather systems coming in off the Atlantic, but it's more showery nature from Wednesday onwards. There will be some sunny spells in between, but it will be blustery and it will be feeling cool for the rest of the week. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Divya and to Nazanin. Let's move directly now to our top story this hour. The families of the victims of triple killer Valdo Calacani have joined calls for the government to overhaul murder laws in the wake of the Nottingham attacks. Barnaby Webber and Grace O'Malley Kumar, who were both 19, and Ian Coates, who was 65, were stabbed to death on the 13th of June last year. Valdo Calacani was given a hospital order in January for manslaughter on the basis of diminished responsibility. A review of the actions taken by the Crown Prosecution Service found prosecutors were right to accept a plea of manslaughter uh, by diminished responsibility from Calicane, who had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. However, the findings did highlight areas where the CPS could have handled the case better. Joining me in the studio now is former Old Bailey Judge Wendy Joseph Casey. Thank you for coming in. And down the line, we're joined by criminal barrister Jeremy Dean Casey. Let's start with you, Wendy. So, so the findings are kind of slightly inconclusive, at least that's how it feels. Well, I think and all they were asked to do mm. was to make a determination of the propriety of the decisions. Yes. The decision that the conclusion they've come to is that following the rules, the CPS were right to accept the plea, but that when you look at the way that they conducted themselves, they didn't meet the standards in relation to proper care for the uh, bereaved families. Um, and I think that's the dichotomy between the two so aspects. So what, what are the standards or expectations of care for bereaved families? Because I think this is a, a facet of law, if indeed it is enshrined in law in any formal way, that most of us know, know absolutely nothing about at all. What, what, what are we told ought to happen for these families? Well, it's not a facet of um, law in the sense of statute or anything of that nature. But the whole purpose of the criminal law is to look after our society. That's why we have the criminal laws, so that we can all live safe and peaceful lives. 
when an offence occurs, one of the duties of the Crown Prosecution Service is to ensure that those who are um, hurt by the offence that is, has taken place are kept informed, kept within the system, understand what is happening. It isn't a requirement that they are actually consulted about the decisions that are made, not because anyone is being unkind, but because the actual decisions that are made by the CPS are laid out in accordance with standards which they must follow. So they are following one set of standards, but at the same time, they should be keeping anyone who has been adversely affected or damaged by the offence in the picture and understanding what is happening and why it's happening. Because in layman's terms, it seems to me, and we have discussed this repeatedly on this programme, as, as you know, and as people listening and watching will know, it seems as if there's been a dissonance, a real disconnect between what the public and what the victims' families feel should have happened in terms of sentencing of Calicani and what the law dictated should have happened and that propriety and protocol and everything else has been found to have been observed. And still, there's a kind of gaping dissatisfaction, a kind of chasm of, of, of feeling that this isn't the right punishment, this isn't the right way to stop murderers murdering, this can't be right, this can't be fair. And the indignation and lack of satisfaction continues to simmer and bubble. Do you think that had the families been treated differently, handled with more care, better informed about what the law is and what its limitations are, then this might have been avoided? I think they're two separate problems. One is the actual sentence. And as you say, there is, there has been expressed a strong feeling that mm. it may not be the right sentence. That is a matter for the Court of Appeal. They will be reviewing that sentence in due course, but they haven't done so yet. The second problem is how the families have been treated. But I think your question really indicates where the problem is. There's been... Um, You've used the word dissonance, mm. which is the right word, but, but, but what it really is, is a failure of communication, a failure to explain why they're doing what they're doing and how it fits into those rules which govern them, the CPS. So there are, there are failures, but the failure is not said to be mm -hmm. the actual decision to accept the pleas to manslaughter. Let me bring Jeremy Dean Casey in. Hello, Jeremy, good to see you. So, so explain a Thank little you, bit uh, about the duty of communicating, the duty of including, though not consulting, but, but, but paying attention to and taking into account the feelings, the emotions, the expectations of the families of, of victims. How in your career have you had to kind of enfold that in what you do or in what you see happening? Uh, well, I think Judge Jones has set out the general framework, which is that you know, it's highly desirable, to say the least, that victims' families are heavily consulted, but there's no obligation to abide by their wishes. I mean, as you know, Vanessa, I am defence counsel, so I have observed the process rather than participated in it in relation to victims throughout my career. What I would say is, and I'm sure Judge Wendy Jones would agree, that in cases where victims' families are consulted and actively involved, um, the sense of, 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 of the, the, the likely sense of, of justice being perceived to be done is so much greater. And it, it, it's been clear to me for a very long time that the CPS do not engage with victims' families enough. They don't do so constructively enough. Very often, even when criminal trials are taking place, um, at the Old Bailey and other court houses, you see victims' families looking somewhat bemused. Um, they're left for periods of time without being fully informed. So I would say this is a crucial aspect of the system, especially in homicide cases, which requires very serious, significant and urgent attention.
Jeremy, if you had provided the CPS, I'm going to ask um, Judge Wendy in a minute the same question, but if you had provided the CPS with a script, with an appropriate script, including the matters that you feel needed to be communicated to the families so that they understood, so they weren't taken by surprise, so they weren't let down, so they didn't feel shortchanged or feel unacknowledged or feel that their beloved loved ones had died in vain, what would yep. you have included? What would have been the sorts of things that you would have wanted the CPS to explain? OK, well, Vanessa, that's a characteristically very, very incisive question. It's not easy to answer that question um, too shortly, but I, but, but I will, and I'll, I'll do my best. I think the key issue is, in some ways, not substance, but form, i.e. That, that the families are kept informed at every stage of the proceedings, that they're not left for periods of time throughout the process uninformed as to what's taking place. Um, in terms of substance, I would say that there has to be a clear explanation and exposition of what's going on. If there are psychiatric examinations on both sides, prosecution and defence, that families are informed when those are to take place, what the purpose of them are, what the outcome is, what the legal framework is, what the procedural process is at every given stage. My experience is that families are left for too long ignorant of what's going to happen, what does happen, and what the consequences are. And here, the families needed to be informed what, what was going on, what the process was, what the legal issues were, are, and what the consequences of that were to be. In general terms, those are the things, if I'd overseen the position, that I would have been, I hope, vigilant to ensure took place. Wendy, would you agree? Are there other things you would have wanted to say? Or yeah. I mean, I think if I was sitting down with the family, um, I, would, I would grasp that, for them, the idea is that manslaughter is less than murder. Yes. And that's what stick, is sticking in their gut. Mm -hmm. That's what is so hurtful. To I them. think everybody thinks that, except well, maybe lawyers. Well, it's not quite right. Right. They're, for murder, Yet there has to be the killing and the intention to kill or cause really serious harm. One sort of manslaughter is less serious than that because it doesn't have the necessary intention. It's got the killing, mm -hmm. but not the intention to kill or cause harm. There's another sort of ma manslaughter, and this other sort is what he has pleaded guilty to. And for this sort of manslaughter, Every element of murder is there. He is, he has committed every element of murder and accepted that. But in addition, there is this state of mind which psychiatrists have said meets the qualifications for reducing responsibility for the murder. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important that people understand this isn't something less than murder. It's a full murder, but it's got an additional element which reduces the responsibility. And, and yet, Jeremy, it's clear, isn't it, that the families particularly feel that the sentence doesn't suffice. I think it's primarily only because I've been discussing this endlessly, but the word hospital yeah. that does it, that's the word. So if, it were, if I were in charge, and I'm not a lawyer, and I wouldn't presume, but if I were doing this, the first thing I would, one of the things I would have explained to the family is what kind of a hospital, what the regime yeah. is like inside it, what Kalakani's life will be like, the fact that he won't be kind of sitting up as, as volunteers come and give him a bunch of grapes, watching telly in a delightfully, you know, chatty and gorgeous hospital ward. It won't be that, because otherwise, it's the word hospital that's the thing. That's yeah. the word that stands mm. out. It isn't prison, and it doesn't sound like prison, and we all know what hospitals are like. We may not choose to go and stay in one, but if you'd rather stay there than a prison, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd be like most other people. So isn't that the stumbling yeah. block, that word? I, I, yeah, I mean, first of all, I'd like to endorse what Judge Joseph has said. I think it's absolutely crucial in this case and in all of this type of manslaughter case that, that the families understand that the defendant is guilty of murder and has admitted murder. And some consideration may need to be given to the label that's put on this 
this type of murder. I don't know. But yes, I absolutely agree with you. When I came on a few weeks ago when this first happened, I think that's the point that I made. Mm -hmm. I mean, th th this, this man is not going to be visited with a bunch of grapes every other Thursday. Um, and, and or, or, or um, some flowers. I mean, and therefore it is crucial, absolutely crucial, that there is the clearest exposition of the harsh, albeit um, hospital environment that he is going to be detained in, and the fact that he that that that, that he will be there for as long as as he was ever going to be in prison, if not eventually in prison. So you're absolutely right. That is the message that needs to be conveyed powerfully and unequivocally. Um, for all future purposes. And so, Wendy, does this carry on? Are we now going to be examining the sentence in a different way, or is this it now that we've had the conclusion? No, there'll be a hearing in the Court of Appeal, uh, a separate hearing, which will be a purely legal hearing to examine the issue of whether the sentence, sentence, the um, sending to hospital, mm -hmm. the sectionings, as it's called, that was passed, was unduly lenient. Um, if it is found to be unduly lenient, it will be replaced by a different sentence. And if it's not, it will then stand. Mm. That will be the end of the legal process. I doubt very much that it will be the end of the discussion, because as we've all been saying, clearly there is something here that needs looking at. It may be semantics, it may be changing the labelling, mm. but if people are hurt by the current labelling, then we must change it. And Jeremy, I just want to ask a kind of personal uh, observational kind of question. In all the years that you've been doing this, when appeals go on and inquiries go on and cases go on and on and on, do you find it to be very difficult indeed for victims' families to begin any kind of healing process, any sort of even attempt at closure, because on and on it goes. It's kind of a, 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 a kind of life, almost like a lifestyle. It takes over all of everything, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, to, to, Vanessa, I know this is not the point we're on. I mean, it's, it's impossible for defendants' families and victims' family, but the focus is here on victims' families, I, absolutely. And sometimes the time that it takes for the process to complete is unacceptable. What I would say is that these days, in relation to Attorney General's references, i.e. prosecution appeals against sentence, they do seem to come on quickly. So the, the families here, I think, will have that sense of procedural closure, closure fairly quickly. But it can be, it can be torturous mm. in some circumstances, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and when do you do just the, th the thought of the family still battling away and still feeling that they're fighting their corner and still fighting for what they think is right? It's heartbreaking, isn't it? And it was already heartbreaking. <coughs> it's, it's them and a long series of other families, other friends, the bereaved, just going back over decades and decades. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. This is what's coming up after the break. A Russian court charges four men over the Moscow concert mass shooting. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Just sit for just one second. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we was supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back. Russia has charged four men it says attacked a Moscow concert hall on Friday night, killing at least 137 people. All four have appeared in court, charged with committing an act of terrorism. The men looked as if they were heavily bruised and showed signs of severe beating, with one suspect brought into the court half-conscious and in a wheelchair. Russia's attempt to pin the attack on Ukraine has been described by French President Emmanuel Macron as cynical and counterproductive. Even though the Islamic State has claimed responsibility Responsibility, Russian President Vladimir Putin has said the suspected attackers attempted to flee to Ukraine. The attack has had repercussions already in Europe, with France raising its terror alert to the highest level. Joining me in the studio now is Ewan Grant. Hello, thank you for coming, a former intelligence analyst. And down the line, I'm joined by Dr Domitilla Sagramoso, a lecturer at the Department of War Studies at King's College London. I'll start with, uh, with Dr Sagramoso. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. So what are you, what are you seeing? is happening here what what is going on um by in in terms of putin's kind of mystifying response to this because islamic state have claimed responsibility what more is there to say well i think it is uh yeah, it was unfortunately expected that uh, probably the russians were going to try to set up a connection with ukraine because they're in a war with ukraine many suspected that ukraine could have been involved and it is an easy target. It's very easy to hit back at, at uh, Ukraine. There is already a war going on, uh, whereas it's much harder to, to, to target at ISIS cells in Central Asia. Uh, the countries of Central Asia are allies uh, of Russia, especially Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, but also to a certain extent Uzbekistan, where many militants come from. And while they may be, may be collaborating with Russia uh, in order to address the challenges, uh, it's very hard to show a very uh, sort of robust response. Uh, and it also helps Russia to sort of galvanize the population behind the operations that they're carrying out uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but at the same time, we see that they are now uh, working with the Central Asians. They probably understand that the problem comes from Central Asia. So at least uh, not to the official public, they're going to be working with these countries in Central Asia to see how they can address these challenges. But I don't see them... Uh, sort of carrying out a massive operation in these areas, they might carry out maybe potentially in a, in a few months, maybe we might see some, uh, some uh, sort of targeting bombing of some of these camps. But I don't think we will see that now immediately. Why not? Why not now? Because this is, this is huge. I mean, this is an appalling massacre, isn't it, of 137 people, including children. Why, why do you say you don't think we'll see it now? 
because uh, because uh, the regime in Russia will have to calibrate very closely whether it wants to open a new front with jihadism in Central Asia. Uh, that, is, that, that entails a risk that there might be additional attacks. We know that many of these operations lead to further radicalization. So uh, the focus of Russia is now in Ukraine. It has a substantial amount of all of its forces there. So it is a bit risky to now open a new front in Central Asia. And also it takes time maybe to identify the targets. Where are you gonna hit? Uh, it's not as after 9-11 where there was a whole country of Afghanistan, which was in the hands of the Taliban, where the Americans could, could operate and carry out a military operation. The Taliban today are uh, to a certain extent in talks with Russia, and although Russia has not, uh, has not recognized the regime of the Taliban, they have developed some kind of ties, unofficial ties, inviting representatives of the Taliban to events in Russia, in Moscow. So they don't want to alienate the Taliban either. So they need to work with these countries, with these leaders, and it takes time to identify the kind of response uh, that, uh, that can be carried out. At the same time, the population in Russia has been very much uh, sort of uh, convinced, has been convinced over the last few days that Ukraine is involved. So it's very easy to respond in that way to the domestic request to act uh, effectively and probably quite quickly. Doctor, thank uh, you. Let, let, let me bring my studio guest in now. Ewan Grant is here. And Ewan, you arrived with a couple of novels. I didn't know whether you thought you were going to have a bit of time to, to, to have a good old read and relax while you were on the show, or if you had another reason for bringing them in. Yes, very much indeed. One isn't a novel. One is very much fact. This is um, Damien Lewis's Operation Relentless, right. which covers Russia's deep state activities in areas of terrorism. Uh -huh. I was... Uh, privilege to contribute something to the new edition. Right. It's a story which isn't over yet, particularly regarding Russian hostage taking. Mm -hmm. But the one in particular, which is a novel, well, some might say it isn't a novel. Right. This is the book I put on the table in front of staff in the EU delegation in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. EU embassy there. So it's Tom Clancy's Just command after authority. The right. Ten years ago next month. And really, there is so much in here, almost, almost to a T with what we are hearing now. Well, as we won't have time to read it right now, give us a, give yeah. us a bit of an Something insight. for the Easter holidays. What, what, which what sorts wet. of parallels are there? Because just brandishing a book and not explaining doesn't Indeed, help us very much. Yes. So what, what do you mean? What kind of parallels? The um, infighting between the various intelligence and security agencies in Russia which are lethal. Mm. Uh, the use of false flags, that's a big, big thing. What do you mean by false flags? Uh, making out that a, an attack is carried out by someone else. Oh, right, OK. Or with the collusion of someone else. And it is all too pat about Ukrainian involvement or complicity. Mm -hmm. This is nonsense. This is 100% counterproductive for Ukraine. Putin is covering up for himself because the Americans very publicly warned in a reasonable degree of detail about avoid concerts two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So it's all out there. And Macron has endorsed that today, and he has good round, grounds to do so because he has links in the Middle East where this may well also have started from. Central Asians have operated, as I've seen myself, mm -hmm. in the Middle East, Syria, Jordan. This is all, everything's connected. Right, so then what do you see happening next? What did you make of what Dr. Sagramosa just said about possibly bombing these particular targets in, in a few months' time? I think that is very, very realistic, if only to satisfy Russian public opinion. Mm -hmm. And given that some of these groups are in remote mountainous areas, well away from the big cities of Central Asia, then the chances are that could be done. And how effective it would be is another thing. The Americans are finding it difficult in Yemen, but it would satisfy Russian public opinion. The Russians have been very careful. They've been implying smears against America. They haven't actually come out and outright denied things. Mm -hmm. They're leaving out for the bots 
the social media plants, mm. who are, of course, to a greater or lesser extent, mm. directed by the government. And Dr. Sacramoso, we, we hear that uh, Emmanuel Macron has put France on high, the highest possible terrorist alert. Is he right to do so? And should Rishi Sunak do the same to us? I think that in the case of France, it is, of course, related to the Olympics this summer. So it, it makes a lot of sense to try to uh, make sure that these kind of uh, attacks do not take place. It's the it's the, 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 the prudent and the right approach. Uh, also, because we know that uh, there have been attempts by these groups to operate also on European soil. For example, in December, I think of last year, there was an attempt by, excuse me, by a group of Tajiks also to carry out an attack on a, on a church in Cologne in Germany. So it is very important to stay on high alert. And I think that uh, the UK should also try to make sure that uh, its level of alert is, is high at the moment. And what do you agree? I think it's always prudent. Um, <coughs> but that said, um, the previous attacks have been in continental Europe. Britain is probably at a lesser risk than continental Europe, but complacency is the enemy of success. Thank you both very much indeed, and this is what's coming up after the break. Oscar-winning actress Olivia Coleman hits out at the gender pay gap in Hollywood. I'm Vanessa Feltz, you'll be talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for yeah. minutes, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV.
Welcome back. Oscar-winning actress Olivia Colman says she'd be paid a lot more for her films if she were a man called Olivia. The British star, known for many roles, including playing the late Queen Elizabeth in The Crown, says the excuse that men attract audiences, therefore men get paid more, has not been true for decades. She says research suggests that women have always been big box office drawers. Joining me now to discuss this, writer and film critic Kaylee Donaldson. Good to have you on board, Kaylee. So some people will think, oh, for goodness sake, Olivia Colman earns more than most people, male or female, could ever dream of. Why is she not simply sitting there happily counting her money and not complaining? I mean, that's true. It's extremely hard to get people to care about the labour issues of the film or entertainment industry. The typical idea we have of actors is as multi-millionaires in their mansions. As we saw with the SAG after strike last year, that's simply not true. The vast majority of actors aren't even earning enough to get health insurance in America. So if even Olivia Coleman, who is an Oscar winner, a BAFTA winner, and a national treasure, isn't getting pay equity, what does that say about every other woman in Hollywood who you haven't heard of? Well, I suppose it says that, you know, she might just be very, very grateful to be earning the vast and voluminous sums that she is earning and not present a public sob story to people who might be earning the minutest, minuscule fraction of what she's taking home. That's what I mean. I think the other issue of that is that in terms of pay equity, I mean, across the board, it's actually very depressing how little has changed in any industry. But in the uh, entertainment industry, there was a report that came out in 2019 that showed that there was basically no change for pay between women and men between uh, 1980 and 2015. And that is incredibly shocking. And you can talk about, you know, someone makes millions and millions, why should I care? But it, what we see in the entertainment industry is typically reflective of other labour issues. Mm. So if it's going on here, think about what it is for you know, women far further down the line, not just acting behind camera, doing anything, really. Well, we know that, for example, at Wimbledon, um, the, the male tennis players traditionally earn enormous amounts of money more than the female tennis players. I think the, um, the explanation given is, you know, they, that women players put fewer bums on seats, make less money in general for tennis and the Lawn Tennis Association, play less vigorously or less energetically or whatever it is, less with less strength and therefore deserve less money. So Olivia Coleman's saying that doesn't apply to female actresses who she says can be big box office and in fact, bigger box office than male actors. Is that true? I think one of the best examples you can give for that is last year and it's called Barbie. It made more money than any other film last year. And that was almost entirely off of the power of a female director, a female producer, a huge cast of women. There are so many other examples. Actually, statistically speaking, women go to the cinema more than men. There used to be this idea that the, the big box office figures were men like Schwarzenegger, were men like Tom Cruise, and that they were the only ones that could get bums in seats. That has not really been the case for about a decade now. I think the bigger sellers are probably things like franchises, Marvel, Star Wars, that kind of thing. So if the rules have changed, really, it stands to reason that the gender pay cap would change to reflect that. And it hasn't. Even for, you know, after Barbie, there should be hundreds of films like that headed by women, getting women in the theaters. Will Hollywood follow? That's a, a different matter. So if all the facts that you've just stated are true, and obviously they're easily easy to prove and absolutely uh, bona fide, then, then why is it that women like Olivia Colman are paid less than their male counterparts? And how can the studios continue to get away with doing that? I mean, that question has been asked so many times over the decades. There are so many huge stars, like people like Jennifer Lawrence had to fight to get equal pay with her male co-stars in American Hustle, for instance. Uh, Olivia Coleman talks about an instance of someone getting 12,000% less in terms of their pay disparity with their male co-star. The industry is very slow to change. We saw that with Me Too, for example. We're seeing that right now as they try to deal with the threat of things like AI. Um, anything that happens in the world tends to be about 15 years later with the film industry. Change is happening, but it is incredibly incremental. And I think that's what's disappointing for a lot of people, is why isn't this happening quicker? There really isn't an excuse. One of the most inspirational fee negotiations in show business history, I bet you know what I'm going to say, was in the sitcom, wildly, wildly successful sitcom Friends, when all the principals simply collaborated instead of playing one, you know, each other off against one another or having secret negotiations conducted by their agents, they didn't. They just formed a unified body and they said, 
we all need to be paid equally and this is what we want and they got it and you wonder why that doesn't happen more because it was such a successful model it worked so brilliantly so you would think that you know let's imagine I don't know Meryl Streep and uh, Alec Baldwin are, are starring in a movie opposite one another you think they just speak meet have coffee and say right how much are you getting paid how much am I getting paid let's sort it out together it would be great if that happened across the board. I think this is one of the reasons that the SAG after strike was so impactful. It's a collective action. That's what takes change. Uh, but there's also this attitude that needs to change as well. Jennifer Lawrence previously talked about how she was afraid to negotiate for fair pay as an Oscar winner and a huge box office star for things like The Hunger Games because she was worried she'd be seen as greedy and selfish. And I think that's something a lot of women deal with is this idea that if you fight for what you deserve, you are you know, pushing it too far and you're letting the rest of the side down. So it's not just a history change that needs to happen. I think there is a, a kind of mental attitude that we're still dealing with too. And so Olivia Coleman has spoken out. Is there a danger that this might mean that studios won't want to employ her because they'll think she's a troublemaker, she's a disruptor, she's not docile, she's not going to just sit quietly and do as she's told, or is she such a talent and Hollywood absolutely appreciate her talent and the breadth and the depth of it that she will carry on conquering in Hollywood anyway and just get better paid in future? I think she'll be okay. We have seen a lot of larger stars talking out in this way. When Patricia Arquette won her Oscar, she used her speech to call out the need for pay equity. Olivia Coleman is a full-on national treasure who is in film and TV and everything else. I think she will be fine. I hope so anyway. It would be ridiculous for people to punish one of our best and most beloved actresses because they were right on a topic that everyone else is right on. Thank you very much indeed for, for joining us this afternoon. This is what's coming up after the break. In the new Slim Down Monarchy, who will be stepping up to fill the King and the Princess of Wales' shoes? I'm Vanessa Phelps and you'll be talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <even> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong.
Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. With both the King and the Princess of Wales currently undergoing treatment for cancer, who will be holding down the royal fort? It appears the King's sister Anne, the Princess Royal, and his sister-in-law Sophie, the Duchess of Edinburgh, will be heavily relied upon, with two of the most senior royals out of action for the foreseeable future. The royal power duo will also be accompanying the Queen when she attends the Easter Sunday church service at St George's Chapel in Windsor. Joining us to discuss this royal commentator, Afia Hagen. Good to have you on board, Afia. I know you've been very busy talking about this all over the world, all over the weekend, since the <laughs> sad news about the Princess of Wales' his cancer diagnosis broke. So who are mm. the frontline stand-ins depping for Kate and for King Charles? Well, definitely Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, and she's always known as the hardest working royal. Whenever you have those surveys at the end of the year of who does the most royal engagements, Princess Anne is always the clear winner. She's got 11 engagements this week. Uh, the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh have two engagements this week. And then you have the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester that are kind of restricted to more local engagements. So it's certainly Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, leading the pack. Queen Camilla will do the Monday Thursday service on Thursday, and that's a really important and quite emotional service just before Easter, just before Good Friday, uh, and it involves the handing out of Monday money to pensioners. So that will happen on Thursday, and then we're looking at Easter Sunday. Now, King Charles is determined to be at uh, church on Easter Sunday, if that goes ahead. It'll kind of be Easter Sunday light, I think it's being described, where probably less people, because he's trying not to be around too many people because of his cancer treatment. But if he doesn't make it, then it will be Queen Camilla and, of course, Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh and Princess Anne. So that's how this week particularly is panning out. Yes, and, 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 and certainly uh, we wondered when we were broadcasting in a, a, a special show on, on Friday evening, uh, just after Kate's announcement of her cancer diagnosis, what would happen in terms of Harry and Meghan, the Sussexes, acknowledging mm -hmm. the diagnosis, reaching out to the, their sister-in-law, making any kind of public statement. And one of the things we found out since is that Harry and Meghan only found the news out when the rest of us did at exactly the same time, six o'clock on Friday. Mm, or it's thought that they might have found out just beforehand, but they certainly certainly weren't given uh, any advanced warning, as in like a week or a couple of weeks. They were told uh, just beforehand, and so uh, the thinking was that they didn't want Harry and Meghan to say anything to anybody else. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have. But you're right in saying they found out around the same time that we all did. Uh, they released that statement through Harper's Bazaar on Friday evening, saying that they wished uh, health and healing for the Princess of Wales and privacy for her to do that. But it's also thought that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have reached out to the Waleses privately also. We don't know what's been said in that communication, but I think that is a good sign that private communications are happening because at this time, I would say these brothers certainly need each other. They absolutely do. It's very difficult for Prince William. His father has cancer. His wife has cancer. He's thinking about three small children as well, how worried they must be. And so this is a time where siblings need each other. You know, families always have these kind of disagreements and fights. There's a lot of water under the bridge, but health is that great leveller, isn't it? I don't know. I'm not sure because I think it is being said that the reason that the Sussexes weren't informed of Kate's diagnosis much before the rest of us, if indeed they were informed uh, before the rest of us at all, is, is a pretty clear reason. And that is because Prince William does not trust his younger brother. Now, if you don't trust somebody and you're always worried that they may quickly put a few details about what you've just said to them in a documentary or in a, a um, some kind of blog that you're there, they're making or some radio show or something, it means you can't really um, allow yourself to have a relationship with them in case they betray you in all sorts of ways. You know, even if you, um, if, even if they were to speak to you on the telephone or send you a card, they never know whether you might utilise it to make money, to sell a story, to turn it 
into a documentary fodder. So I wonder whether that will be the key impediment here. I think it's clear that the trust between the brothers is non-existent at the moment. That's absolutely crystal clear. And you can see why Prince William would feel that way. Uh, the Sussexes, excuse me, the Sussexes have said that, you know, the projects that they're working on going forward are going to be about different things than the royal family. So I don't think there will be any more documentaries or any more books concerning discussions in the royal family, uh, their time in the royal family, what happened when they decided to step back as working royals. I think that's all been done and dusted. They've actually said that's all been done and dusted and they're moving forward with other projects. So hopefully the projects they have going forward won't need to even have these kind of discussions in them. Uh, but both sides need to build trust. Absolutely, I agree with you on that one. Talking about relationships, though, there does seem to be a very, very special relationship that is being forged even more deeply deeply and ever more strongly since Kate's diagnosis, and that is the relationship between Catherine and her father-in-law, the King, which really does seem to be a relationship of real mutual respect and very deep love and regard, um, particularly obviously consolidated by the fact that they're both um, suffering from cancer at the same time, or they both had a cancer diagnosis. Absolutely, but what an unfortunate thing for them to have to bond over. But we did get some details over the weekend that there was an emotional lunch in Windsor just before uh, Kate's announcement. Uh, of course, we had that statement from King Charles III saying how saying how proud he was of the Princess of Wales for coming out with that statement and talking about what she's going through. And also we had details about the time spent uh, where they were both at the London Clinic and them toddling up and down the hallways to see each other. And so I think it's great that they've got this relationship. You know, each other knows what the other one is going through. Uh, and support is absolutely vital at this time. You know, at the end of Kate's statement, she talked about uh, anyone else that's going through this, you know, have hope, keep the faith in you're not alone. And she's definitely found someone uh, that she can confide in, that she can lean on, and who knows what she's going through. The King has found that as well. And that's really, really important for both of them in their recovery. Thank you, Afia, very much indeed. Always good to see you. I'm joined now, as you can see, by my delightful colleague Ian Collins. Good to see you, Ian. Good to see you, So too. what can we look forward to? Well, we are talk? going to crack into that free speech debate because there's yes. quite a lot to be said about that. We've got a great panel. Uh, Lord Ed Vasey, of course, who you know would ordinarily be seen speaking in the House of Lords, clad with his ermine, mm -hmm. um, is here to give his views on that, along with... Uh, Esther is back on with us as well, Penny Smith as well. And also this, I love this story, the rise of the Gen Z, Gen Z millionaires. Have you seen this? Yes. There's more under 30 How millionaires How do they manage than it? Than been. <laughs> well, there's a whole cross-section of, of different, whether it's sport or music, a lot of tech entrepreneurs as well. Yes. But it's gone up significantly since pre-lockdown. It was around about 650. It's gone up to about 850. What is behind it? Who are those people? Who are the big winners, the Gen Z rich kids? Just it's, imagine those starting so young with all that dosh. Would you a leaper is worth 75 million pounds. Wow. I mean, 75 million quids, which he's worth more than Raheem Sterling, and he plays for Chelsea. Gosh. Well, yes. But I mean, that's an injustice right there. Well, is it? Or she's well, I say he plays for Chelsea. Hugely he turns talented. up every couple of weeks. Who would you rather hear singing? Who would you very, rather watch dancing? It's a very good point. You don't never you never don't, confuse you the don't two. Want but they're both you. worth squillions. Yeah. That's the point. Okay. How did they do it? We'll look at that the as well. The politics of envy on the talk Absolutely. tonight, no indeed. doubt. Look forward to seeing that. Thank you very much indeed. Very sadly, we've now reached the end of the show. It's the talk, as you know, coming up next. Don't miss a minute of it. Thank you so much for tuning in. And do join me at the same time tomorrow. That's 4pm. Have a wonderful evening. Lots of love and a very good night to you. Good night. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> but this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs>
Independent Republic of Mike Graham. <laughs> Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, we're missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the 